Welcome everybody. We're here again with Mr. Stefano Inama from Anctad to discuss the issues which are at stake when we talk about rules of origin. So my question for you today is what is at stake for least developed countries? We know they account for just 1% of goods trade, even though they account for 12% of the world's population. What's, what's at stake for them when we talk about rules of origin? Well, it's very simple. It's about money <laughs> in the sense that um, you think about uh, uh, the case of bicycle, which is uh, uh, now has been uh, Cambodia is one of the LDCs and has been uh, successfully uh, exporting and developing uh, uh, an industry of bicycle in, uh, in, very, in the recent uh, decade. Why so? Basically, if the same bicycle are exported from uh, Vietnam, they pay a, a 10% uh, rate of duty. If they are exported from another developed countries, they pay 40% rate of duty when they are imported to the European Union. If the same bicycle are exported from Cambodia, they enter duty free. So 14% is a huge profit margin for a company which goes and establishes themselves in Cambodia, is able to comply with the rules of origin in exporting this bicycle uh, from Cambodia to the European Union. That's thanks, I mean, to the, also to the reform of the European Union rules of origin back in 2011, which has boosted, I mean, which have provided additional incentive uh, to establish manufacturing in LDCs by providing special uh, rules of origin for LDC countries. And Cambodia is one of the important examples that uh, is, is, I would say, a success story. Well, but why would a country want to treat goods such as bicycles differently depending on where they're coming from? Because countries, they have trade policies. In the trade policies, sometimes they, they have, uh, as you say, there is a movement also uh, in the UN, the UN Sustainable Development Goals, uh, through which you're providing a special and differential treatment uh, uh, to developing countries, and especially to LDCs, uh, to increase uh, their uh, economies, uh, their export earnings, and uh, you provide trade preferences and by cut, as I said, I made an example, 40% to duty free in order to create uh, an incentive for industries uh, uh, which were located maybe in Taiwan or maybe in, in neighboring countries like uh, uh, Vietnam to relocate in LDCs in order to create jobs there and create an economy there, which could alleviate uh, the poverty of the population in LDCs. So it's a trade policy objective. This trade policy objective is translated uh, into trade preferences. However, in order to benefit from these trade preferences, you need to comply with rules of origin. And that's why it's important uh, for these countries, even LDCs, to understand and comply with rules of origin, because they have an impact in their economies. I see. Can we, can we go back to the bicycles example here on this point? Well, the bicycle example is, is I would say, is a, I would say, I repeat myself, but it's a little more text in the sense that on one end, the European Union at a certain point in time has created this incentive uh, for Cambodia to, and not only Cambodia, but for the LDCs, uh, with better rules of origin uh, to create uh, uh, economic growth. Uh, and investment in these countries to benefit from these trade preferences. But on the other hand, the rules of origin may also have a bearing on other trade policy instruments, like uh, anti-dumping. Uh, in the case of anti-dumping, you want to punish through additional tariff uh, countries that are exporting uh, to you, like in the case of the European Union, has been putting an anti-dumping duty on bicycle coming from China, and this anti-dumping duty is, very, is huge, is 48.5%. Now, at a certain point in time, uh, the European uh, Association of Manufacturers uh, believed that uh, the Chinese were circumventing this duty by exporting pieces of bicycle in Cambodia and then putting, assemble the bicycle in Cambodia, becoming originating in Cambodia and entering duty-free the European Union. So an investigation was launched to see if the bicycle were Cambodian or Chinese, because they are Cambodian, duty-free. If they are Chinese, it's 48.5%, which is a huge 
difference. And the Cambodian producers were, were able to demonstrate that the bicycles were originating in Cambodia. And also demonstrating because a certain value added was made in Cambodia according to the rules of origin applicable by the European Union in this specific case. So once again, rules of origin are important for them. I have another question, but goods from least developed countries, don't they automatically get a special treatment? We have the Hong Kong decision in the World Trade Organization back in 2005, which says that uh, uh, WTO members are committed to grant uh, duty-free and quota-free for goods originating in least developed countries. However, it's easier said than done. First of all, you have to provide this duty-free and, uh, and, and quota-free treatment, which the European Union is already doing uh, back in 2011. Why the United States does not provide uh, duty-free or quota-free for all products. Uh, for instance, it, it, it excludes uh, textile and garments uh, for LDCs uh, from the coverage of this duty-free. Uh, and this is a big chunk of uh, exports from uh, Bangladesh, Cambodia, and other L LDCs. But on top of this, you also need to comply with the rules of origin. And to comply with the rules of origin, sometimes it may be difficult, uh, because think about uh, that uh, certain rules of origin require to add 35% uh, uh, of value added. 35% of value added is a lot, because it means that uh, you need to have uh, the work that you've done in that country needs to add up up to 35%. But the work in these countries is cheap labor. So how do you comply? The rule says value added has to be done by working or processing in an LDCs and originating material there. But in many LDCs, if you want to manufacture a product, there are not even the basic ingredients. There are no plastics. There are no electronics. Uh, there, there is no steel. There is no aluminum. So it's very difficult to reach, I mean, this 35% value added or other criteria rules of origin. Well, if the goal here is to help least developed countries, why not making these criteria less demanding? And that's what we are trying, I mean, since decades. Uh, but, you know, that multilateral rules, uh, first of all, these are unilateral trade preferences. In the sense that this is a kind of gift that the developed world is giving to the LDCs and developing countries. And we want to be sure that this gift goes to the direct people, to the right people. So they want to be sure that if I give you a tariff preference, it goes to products that are genuinely manufactured in African countries, African LDCs, and Cambodia, not to goods that are transshipped from China through these countries to benefit from these trade preferences. So how do you do this? You say that the goods have to be originating in LDCs. However, the problem is that there is no um, multilateral harmonization on rules of origin. So Japan is granted duty-free, quota-free, but it has its own set of rules of origin. US, they are granting duty-free, quota-free, but they have their own set of rules of origin, and so on. Many prefer there is no, each preference has a different set of rules of origin, and this is extremely complicated for least developed countries because they have to comply with different criteria according to the country destination. That's, I mean, really bothersome, especially when you think that in these countries there are small and medium enterprises. I mean, there are no big companies uh, uh, like Nike, Adidas, uh, uh, Nestlé, this, they are not present there. You know, there are small and medium sized enterprises or there are small departments units. Okay, then at the end, what is needed to improve the situation in least developed countries? We need uh, multilateral rules of origin, uh, which are simpler and transparent for LDCs. And to this end, uh, there are ongoing discussion in, uh, in WTO uh, since uh, uh, 2014 in order to, how to improve the transparency and make a simple rules of origin. And that the UI, they join forces by uh, conducting uh, executive training here at uh, UI uh, in order to train the delegates, the LDC delegates that are negotiating uh, simpler and transparent rules of origin in WTO. 
We are also bringing uh, private sectors uh, which are located in the LDCs uh, to the WTO in order to share their experiences in complying uh, the difficulties in complying with different set of rules of origin. But obviously, it's very much difficult to convince these countries that a reform is needed. I mean, all their own rules of origin, because a reform uh, needs change in legislation. It means that politicians they need to go to parliament. And even if it is a good cause, which is the good cause for helping the LDCs, it's not that difficult to convince countries to go to, go, to, go to their parliament. I mean, and introduce laws and regulations to change the actual ones in order to help uh, LDCs. So that's our challenge. Anyway, I mean, we, I believe that we have obtained very good results in the sense that uh, the Nairobi decision uh, uh, in WTO of 2015 uh, is also the result of the work that has been conducted here at the, at the UI by training these, uh, these delegates. Obviously, obviously, there is much more work that needs to be done. But I think that there, I mean, we already uh, achieved a kind of benchmark. And, uh, and with that benchmark, we also assist the international community in putting firmly uh, this issue of rules of origin for LDCs in the agenda in WTO, which previously was not there. I think, I mean, it's something that in today's world is quite remarkable. That's great. Thank you very much, Stefano. Thanks, everybody, for watching and stay tuned for the next interview.